just want to say, wow, what a powerful film. Um, I'd like to thank again NPEF for creating the film, but also giving us the opportunity to view it tonight. Um, and I think it's given our community sort of two things. So first, it encapsulates much of the history of schooling in our city, but it offer, also offers a compelling plea for equity that's been missing from our schools throughout Nashville's history and that we still struggle to achieve and ensure. Um, so my hope is that this film will spark some discussion, uh, not just with the panel, but sort of more generally uh, in our communities uh, and help us start, start thinking of ways we can all work towards addressing uh, many of the inequities uh, in our community. You know, one thing that Peabody College is doing um, is starting a new research practice partnership with Metro called PEER that puts the focus squarely on solving disparities within our public schools, that, uh, disparities that limit student achievement and student potential. Um, many people have been working hard on this, including one of our panelists, uh, Professor Maury Nation. So I'm sure our panelists have lots of thoughts uh, that they'd like to share. So I'm gonna first introduce our um, facilitator tonight, uh, Alfred uh, De Graffenried. De Graffenried. De Graffenried, sorry. <laughs> My bad. It's all good. I knew I'd do it. Um, he's a native Tennessean um, and has experience uh, on the local, state, and federal levels of government. Uh, Alfred uh, previously served as the Chief Administrative o Officer for the Office of the Davidson County Criminal, uh, Criminal Court Clerk. Prior to serving the Metro Nashville government, he was legal counsel to U.S. Representative Jim Cooper and coordinated community outreach for Davidson, Dixon, and Cheatham counties. Uh, he holds a bachelor's and master's degree from Tennessee State University and is a doctor of jurisprudence from Indiana University's Robert McKinney School of Law. Um, he, was, it, he was recently uh, announced as a new member in Vanderbilt's Leadership Academy. So I'm gonna turn the podium over uh, to Alfred, who's gonna introduce our panelists. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Dwayne, and thank you for this opportunity. I wanna welcome everyone here this evening. Again, I'm Alfred de Graffenry from the Division of Government and Community Relations here at Vanderbilt, and we're pleased to partner with Peabody. First, wanna extend a Great big thanks to Peabody's EDI division, uh, Hasina, uh, Moy, you didn't, and uh, Dwayne, thank you as well for, for doing this. At this time, I'll go ahead and introduce our, um, the panel for today. And I'll start with my dear friend, Christian Bugs, who is the chair of the Metro Nashville Public Schools Board of Education. She's a native Nashville, she's a Nashville native and former MNPS student who went on to, on to earn a bachelor's degree in physics and two master's degrees in education before returning to MNPS as a middle school math teacher. As a teacher, mother, and policymaker, she has experienced our schools in several different ways throughout the course of her life. Christian is also a founding board member of the Equity Alliance, a Nashville-based 501c3 that seeks to educate, engage, and empower minorities around the civic process. Christian's full-time role at United Way of Greater Nashville keeps her heavily involved in supporting Nashville's young people and engaging stakeholders. Currently, she serves as the Manager of Literacy Partnerships for the Blueprint for Early Childhood Success, a citywide initiative focused on increasing literacy in our youngest learners. Thank you for being here, Thank you. Christian. Next, I'd like to introduce Ashford Hughes, uh, Ashford is the Executive Officer for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Metro Nashville Public Schools. He is an experienced government and political professional with a demonstrated history of working on complex issues related to organizational diversity, equity, and inclusion. He has strong communication skills and has the ability to clearly define the problem and design the needed blueprint for solution-based outcomes. Professional collaborative skills, working alongside nonprofit, grassroots, business, and government leaders. Thank you for being here, Ashford. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mari Nation. He is a professor, professor 
in the Department of Human and Organizational Development. Mari's clinical research focuses on understanding and preventing violence and bullying among school-aged children. His specific interests are bully and victim typologies and the short and long-term consequences of peer harassment. His community research is focused on understanding community and neighborhood qualities and characteristics that promote positive health and mental health outcomes. Thank you for joining us this evening, Dr. Nation. All right, so um, we're gonna go ahead and move to the Q&A just to level set for a moment. I know there will likely be questions from the audience and from our virtual audience, and we'll get to those, but I'll kick off a few questions just to get us started. So um, it is very important to understand the past so that you can shape the future. I think that everyone will agree with me in that. What was most intriguing about the Nashville's past as outlined in By Design? And how did the film reflect your own experience or your parents' experiences in school? How about we start with you? Sure, so I've seen this documentary a number of times and I was telling Ashford, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, I was telling uh, Al earlier. It happens all the time, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I was telling Alfred earlier that, you know, this movie, this documentary triggers me. It's, it is well-developed, well-produced, it is thorough, it gives a great history of public schools and, and policy and why things are the way they are. But it triggers me because I am from Nashville. I grew up in Nashville. My mother grew up in Nashville. My grandfather grew up in Nashville. My great grandparents grew up in Nashville. And my grandfather was in the legislature. And hearing the stories, he, he talked about North Nashville and how things came to pass. You know, um, if you listen to a state legislator now explain why the metropolitan Nashville government is, uh, is set up the way it is, they will say to better support and better provide resources to communities in outlying counties or in, in surrounding areas outside of Nashville or barely outside of Nashville. But when you talk to black Nashvilleans who, who were around in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, they will say, well, uh, black legisl or le legislators from uh, predominantly white counties were coming into black Nashville, urban Nashville, the urban core, and they didn't want to see Nashville have a black mayor. And then I just, so it, I'm having to juxtapose what I was growing up, what I grew up learning versus what is now taught or talked about. And it's just a, very much a tale of two cities. And I, it's, it's always hard to say, you know, how, does, how do I feel after watching this documentary because there's so many different threads I can pull on. But I guess the one I would hone in on is the idea that we focus so much on policy that we forget people. That policies are only as productive, they're only as effective as they are sustainable. Policies are only as effective as people are willing to accept them. You know, just a couple of years ago, we had a director of schools who was shifting policy to better support disenfranchised students, to better shift resources equitably to black schools or predominantly black schools. And he was ousted because of that. You know, no matter what you hear, I was on the board and that is what happened. That as soon as some of our most affluent, predominantly white schools felt like they were losing something to give something to black schools or predominantly black schools, all of a sudden he must have been mismanaging money. And so I struggle now to not be disenchanted with policy because I've got to focus on the people that might push back. And often it's our most affluent neighbors who just so happen in Nashville to be white. It's those neighbors who claim to sometimes be liberal and be progressive who are pushing pushing the most against equity measures. And so I, when I see this film and I think about what it is now like to have my own son in MPS who goes to his own school that is predominantly black. And even though I'm the chair of the board, I hear from everyone how I should be sending him to magnet schools, or I should be sending him to a private school, or I should be homeschooling him. No, he can go to that school right down the street. That baby is doing great, you know? And so I, I, I again, I know I can, it, it, I struggle to articulate all of my thoughts because I, I almost have to fight back the tears to think about how so much work happened in the past to get us to this point where inequity is still a thing, but then how much is happening right now today to maintain that inequity, even though on the surface it's, it feels like we're not. Thank you, Christian, and, and to everyone here and watching, that is why we call her Madam Chair <laughs> of the school board. So thank you for that comment. So same question, Ashford, what, what intrigued you the most about this film? So I had to write a couple of things down. I've, I've witnessed this and been on several panels about this uh, over the last couple of months. One of the words and one of the things that I wrote down is uh, Chairwoman Bugs talks about people, not policy. 
after serving four years in the mayor's office as the chief diversity and equity officer, I often think of policy and I think of the words intelligent, intelligent zoning and what that meant through the process and how that was a way to disenfranchise certain communities. When we look at urban renewal, and I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and urban renewal didn't just uh, occur by happenstance, it was an intentional policy to put highways and interstates through, if you look across the country, African-American economic hubs, right? It didn't just happen, it was planned that way. And I think those are things that I saw. I look at the similarities between the keep our schools white, uh, all the protests that were out there, and I fast forward to 2021, and I see the anti-CRT, don't teach our kids a certain thing to make us feel a certain way. And I see the similarities in these things. I also look at my experience uh, growing up in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is definitely not as diverse as Nashville is today. And I think about, in the uh, depiction, the expectations of what it means to teach black children and the expectations, sometimes the low expectations, then many teachers who had no cultural wealth or cultural experience with black families and students, not having high expectations for students. And then I fast forward again to 2020, and I look at, do we have culturally competent teachers in our classroom right now that understand the cultural wealth of not just black community, but brown communities, LGBT community? Do we, and have we made shifts in order to see these things happen? But I keep going back to this understanding that a school was bombed, right? A school was bombed with children. Luckily, there were no children in there, but someone sought out to say, we want to make it so that black children are not in this school so bad that we're going to bomb this school. I think about that church in Alabama where those young girls were bombed in church. And I think about those similarities. I also think about as we talk about people, as I look at the film and I look at the faces of the little black children who are walking to school with their families just wanting to go to class. And I see them in class with their white counterparts just smiling, oblivious to anything. And then I think about the faces of the parents. And I think to myself, as a parent of two children myself, those families wanted the same thing white families wanted. I want my kid to go to a safe school. I want them to feel a sense of belonging. I want them to have rigorous content. I want them to be happy and have joy. And I think often, tracing throughout history, black people just want to be. Right? We just want to be and exist. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our existence has been a threat or seen as a detriment to others, and it has tracked continuously till today. So we talk about similarities, right? Everybody always talks about that was oh so long ago. Slavery was so long ago. Up until 1862, it still was illegal in certain states for black people to be able to read, right? Just 1862, that isn't like a thousand years ago. Right in the 50s, we were seeing these things take place. And before I turn it over to Dr. Nation, I think of observation. We talk about Brown versus Board happened in 1954. Between 1954 and 1998, when we finally ended up leaving court, we put a man on the moon. We made microwave dinners. <laughs> we had it where we could go outside and put a card into a box and money was distributed back out to us. ATM machines, we have a football team here in 1996, but we still were in court to integrate schools. Think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. And I just think about where are we now and how do we continue to move forward and just being the city that we say we are and letting our actions back that up. Wow. So now that's why we call him the chief officer of diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion for MMPS. So if, if the trend goes the way I expect it to go, uh, I'm about to introduce to you uh, Dr. Nation, and I'm going to ask you the same question. What intrigued you the most about this film? Well, I've had the chance to see this uh, several times as well, and uh, I, I I hearken back to something Chairman Buck said, uh, which is that each time I see it, 
it triggers something else. I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't think um, it's hard to describe the types of pain that you see reflected and articulated at various points of this film. Uh, and you know, I, I think this, this particular time, I, I found myself focusing again on the, just on the pictures of the young folk. And as, uh, as uh, Mr. Hughes uh, described, I mean, just wanting to have an education and realizing that one has to go through all of these barriers and that, that people are, are actually angry about you wanting to have an education. Uh, that's a burden that, um, that we found, that we see young people, um, elementary school age kids carrying. And, and I would say that even today we see, yeah, you know, if you look across the metro schools, there are some clear differences around resources and the ways in which um, these schools are thought of. And, and one of the things that I'm struck by is that young people aren't, aren't dumb. They're not blind to this. I mean, and I think ultimately it, it reflects, um, you know, the way our schools are reflect us um, as a community. And I, I, I hope that gives us pause um, in, in terms of, um, I, I think of one line in, in the documentary where um, uh, one of the, um, the activists says, you know, Nashville isn't as progressive racially as, as we like to think it is because we have schools that don't reflect kind of progressive racial policies. And that's on us, I mean, collectively. And, and I hope that this documentary is a way in which we begin to challenge some of those, those policies and practices. Thank you, Dr. Nation. I, I too, uh, this, this is my second time uh, watching the documentary and, and I picked up on a few things uh, that I didn't pick up on the first time. So thank you for the comments. Now, uh, moving to the next question, and, and I understand that Ashford works for Metro Schools, and uh, we have the Madam Chair of the school, uh, the, the board here, and I know you've done quite a bit of work with Metro Schools as well, Dr. Nation. Um, so what, 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 what was your opinion of Metro Schools prior to watching this film? And, if it, and, and let us know if, if it changed any. Like, and we're talking about the present right now. So we just watched the past and we're in the present. So did anything trigger you in this uh, documentary that make you think differently about Metro Schools and any, anyone can start? So I don't think anything made me think differently. My, my first intro into um, public schools, I'm a public school person myself. It's funny, my mother in Knoxville threatened to send me to private school if I didn't quit acting up in school myself. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna get myself together because I didn't want to go to private school because you had to wear a uniform and I didn't want to wear a uniform. Uh, but my, my foyer into public education really has been with my son and me and my wife and our first child, uh, uh, we had no idea what the schools were, where we wanted to send them, what it would look like. And all we knew was that my nephew in uh, Knoxville went to a Montessori school. By all intents and purposes, we thought they were outside on the grass, you know, burning incense, looking at rainbows all day. But we found out Montessori was a lot more than that. So we ended up getting in the lottery and was able to get him in a school within our neighborhood. Uh, but it's a Montessori-based school that has been very productive for him. Uh, we and I have always been a proponent for public schools uh, because I think it gives you a wide range of what a city actually looks like. Uh, this film did not change anything about the way that I feel towards public education. It just showed me that the fight that I have, the, the, the charge must continue on because we're dealing with different layers of historical context, institutional context, systematic context, and then the individual context as we engage as individuals with teachers and students and educators and families in the process of public education. I think this film, hopefully, the context is, how do we look at the history 
right? First of all, we can't solve a problem if we don't acknowledge the problem. That's first. And then as we acknowledge the problem, hopefully then we work together in a collaborative way to lend ourselves to uh, find solutions to the problems. So we know what the problem is. And I think now is the time that we all have to understand the investment that we all must take because as the school system goes, so does a city, right? Because we are creating the citizen of tomorrow. We are creating the neighbor that you're gonna be knocking on the door to borrow sugar from. And you, hopefully he is someone that believes in your diversity and your personhood to be able to invite you in and to be able to have community conversations with you. So for me, this just highlighted where we don't want to be anymore, the mistakes we don't want to make, and how we forge relationships and partnerships moving forward to support all families and all children. Thank you, Ashford. And I'll say the, this film didn't make me think any differently about MMPS per se, but it did encourage me to reflect on my experiences, my experience as a student, my experience as a teacher, now my experience as a parent, and then it kind of forced me to try to put language to that, to try to articulate what those thoughts were in reflection. And so I'm a graduate of MLK, it's a magnet school here. It was number one in the state when I graduated, right? To give you some context of my family though, my uncle is Representative Harold Love Jr. My grandfather was State Representative Harold Moses Love Sr. And so I came from a family that was at the very least um, savvy about the system. They understood what resources were out there. But my grandparents were very intentional about sending my uncle and my mom and my uh, aunts all to White's Creek, White's Creek High School. And White's Creek High School is where State Representative Harold Moses Love graduated, where Public Defender uh, Martisa Johnson graduated, where um, Erica Gilmore graduated, Angie Dalton graduated. I mean, these are judges, these are lawyers, these are uh, you know civil servants that people should know, right? But when I came up, all of a sudden, my mom was like, nah, we'll send you to the magnet school. And so I think often about, again, people. I think this document documentary encouraged me to encourage my peers to stop feeling like you have to go outside of your school, stop going outside of your neighborhood. Why is it that we feel like we have to win the lottery? We have to send our kids to an MLK, a Hume Fogg, uh, in any other school outside of our zone because at the end of the day, if, if I send my school to, if I send my son to anywhere other than Buena Vista, McKissick and Pearl Cone, I'm taking my natural resource out of that school cluster. If my council member who says to me that, you know, he just feels uncomfortable because he doesn't want his white daughter to be the only white kid in our black, in our, you know, predominantly black school. If you have the school board chair and you have the council member there, how much, how much of a resource can we be to that school? How can we make sure that we fundraise and that we shift resources? But if we both opt out, we're taking our own natural resources as parents, it's just as parents that are in, involved and active, but we also take our titles away. And so it's like, I, I, it, I was just encouraged to continue to think about how we as people want to pull ourselves away and make it someone else's problem to solve. I, will, I, I remember uh, hearing The Promise. If you've never heard the podcast, please listen to it. Nice white parents that's in New York and then the promise that's in, uh, that focuses on schools in East Nashville. If you have some time, just listen to them both. But there's a segment there uh, where Big Fella, he's a, a parent in East Nashville says, black people can't solve racism. And so I think about Dr. Adrian Battle being the director and I think about me being the chair and people look at us, like, why don't you just shift policy? <laughs> to focus on equity, shift policy. And I said, well, because black people can't fix racism. So even in our titles, even in the seats that we sit in, we consistently have these battles when it comes to shifting resources. We consistently have these battles when we talk about zone schools and when we talk about gentrifying neighborhoods, but still parents opting out of the natural resource that, that they would be in their zone schools. And so I, it, it, again, the documentary didn't shift how I view the school, but it did shift how I view the people that are in schools or the people that have opted out of those schools. What does that say? And who do we expect to fix it if we as parents don't believe in our area schools? As we have, if we have, as community members feel like, well, yeah, somebody needs to go to Buena Vista. Somebody needs to go to Maplewood. Somebody needs to go to Pearl Cone. But why does it have to be my kid? Why do I have to sacrifice? That's, that phrase, why, does, why do I have to sacrifice my child just grinds my gears. I went to Cumberland and now I can't get people in Bordeaux to send their kids to Cumberland. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so I, again, I just think about what will it take to solve the issue if people don't feel like, if, if community members, if adults don't feel like it is our issue to solve. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nation. 
So I, my, uh, I, I'm just excited to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I, I guess that my opinion didn't change because so much of my research has focused on looking at how schools are embedded within community. Um, I think it was exciting, though, to see how this story told in the way that it, that it was, in, in the sense that um, schools have, have forever, as we saw in this documentary, have been reflective of a whole variety of, of decisions that are made, not just in school buildings and not just at the district. Uh, so uh, decisions about housing, decisions about investment in infrastructure, all are reflected in, uh, ultimately in kind of what happens in, in, in the ability of schools to be successful. So I, I appreciate this, this documentary really starting to shine the light outside of the school building to say that there is this responsibility for the community to make sure that we establish uh, um, an environment both within our schools but also in our broader community that allows all young people to be successful. And, uh, and that's particularly true for young people of color given that we know that there have been consistent policies and practices within, within this community and so many others that have systematically tried to disadvantage uh, communities and young people of color. Thank you. And I'll, I'll share a quick, quick example to kind of tie this together in, in a slightly different vein. I recently had a conversation with uh, Mayor Stephen Reed from uh, Montgomery, Alabama, who attended uh, Morehouse College. And uh, apparently he didn't want to go to Morehouse College, but his father turned to him and said, well, if it was good enough for Dr. King, it's certainly good enough for you. So to your point, Ashford, you know, I grew up in public schools as well. And uh, that, that's a non-negotiable for, for our family. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I both uh, grew up in public schools, and that's something that we really care about. Mm -hmm. And we want to have our kids in public schools. So I just wanted to share that, that analogy. So um, I'll move on to it. I want to, before I move on, I want to remind everyone online, if you have a question, please drop it in the chat. We have someone um, uh, catching those. And if you have questions, it, We'll just make sure you remember those questions because we'll get to them in a moment. So um, I'll move to, I'm going to go to a question further down on my list. So why is it important to have a fair and equitable public school system? I know we all touched on it. You talked about it. We saw this video. Why is it important? Uh, Astrid, I know you talked about the industries that are coming here. They can't, you know, it's not enough people to fill those jobs. What are some other reasons why we should have a fair and equitable public school system? You want to start with me or you want Dr. Would you start with Dr. Nation? Open so, up. Anybody. You know, one of the things, and uh, again, I am a, a huge believer in public education. I believe it is the best hope for this nation to realize this, uh, you know, the, the, the ideals of this nation. And I think that, um, you know, as we think about what it's going to, to take um, to, to have thriving communities, um, equity, you know, equity starts, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those central things. I mean, I think about schools now, they serve as, in many ways, as shock absorbers for social problems. I mean, uh, that is that we, uh, in many ways, the schools don't get to, to opt out of dealing with issues of poverty, uh, issues of, of violence and inequity. Uh, and uh, in that sense, it means that we have to have a strong institution. I mean, this is, uh, if, if we want a, a community that is, is able to to be the type of space that we all want to live in and, and that we all can thrive in, um, there, is, there are a few places that touch everyone in the community the way that schools do. Uh, and I, so that, it's one of the reasons why I believe there is such an obligation 
for us as a community to 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 make investments here even if we even if we can't make them in other places it's so important that we make investments uh, in our schools thank you but i think um as i said earlier as um education goals, so does the city, and I believe public education, education in general, we are the access point to developing human beings. Like, I really believe that analytical skills are important. I believe that an educated citizenry, educated residents is important to a thriving city. I believe equity, and you know, equity means a lot of things to a lot of people, but equity means students, families getting what they need when they need it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe in equality, right? But I understand that equity is vitally important because different students have different needs. And we have to address those specific needs at a given point in time to make certain that we are creating conditions by which those students can grow and thrive. I think when we talk about communities, right, I don't think we have many communities anymore in Nashville. I think we have various neighborhoods, but within a community, because of equity, the people that are indigenous to the community own businesses, they own stores, there's commerce that stays within that community, right? That community, it doesn't all go down, and I love it, it doesn't go all down to Broadway and that area, but it is dispersed across these 528 miles of uh, city that we have. Um, why is equity important? Because it is just. It is about justice and fairness. Also, when I think about why is equity important at this point in time? Because it's about children. It's about looking in those families, those children's eyes and saying, we value you. Right? We value you for what you bring to the human spirit. Not we value you because we need you to get the skills to go and work for Amazon, which I love Amazon, I'm part of Amazon, but more about equity should be about lived experience, students experiencing who they are as a self, experiencing their self-identity, much more so than to just align themselves to get a job. And I think to date, we haven't lived out equity because I don't believe we have a clear defined definition of a, as a community as to what equity is and what it looks like. As our chairwoman said earlier, there's a book by Heather McGee called The Sum of Us, and she talks about the, um, the, the pool theory, the, the uh, um, covered in pool theory in the 60s when a lot of communities were gonna integrate and they were gonna integrate at swimming pools, right? Instead of allowing integration to happen at these swimming pools, many communities dumped dirt over them and they became like parks, so to speak just so they would not allow for integration at swimming pools. Equity is not a zero-sum game. Racial equity is not a zero-sum game. If we provide and support the needs of these students, it is not happening at the detriment of other students that might not have an expressed need at that given point in time. I believe equity is important because, damn it, it's the right thing to do, right? And sometimes, as people, we have to do the right things because it makes, for me, it makes our communities whole, right? I don't want to say I'm too pie in the sky, but I believe in humanity, right? And we are here to serve one another. And when some people feel as though my, uh, me getting what I need is a detriment to them, then we continue to have these cycles of, okay, you're doing a little bit here, we give you some progression, but then we're gonna back off and put policy in there because you're progressing too fast. And I think equity, once we all understand and realize what that actually means, we see how it benefits everyone, right? We see that if everybody has equity within our ecosystem, then we can uh, eliminate some of the negative things that we see within our community right now. Equity doesn't guarantee that a student is gonna be successful to get a 4.0 or get in a Vanderbilt. What equity assures is that they have an opportunity to be successful and get the resources they need. At the bare minimum, should we not want that for every student within this city? Oh, there's so many thoughts and you all just made me think just that much more. I think as, a, as an educator, as a community leader, this is a bit of an existential question because it should just be that, you know, we care about everybody else's kids, that I don't just care about my kid, 
I care about yours and yours and yours. You know, everybody's child should be treated like my own. And if I want the very best for Christopher, then I should want the very best for every child. But then when I, when I think about being a teacher and I think about the number of students that I've lost because I've always worked in predominantly black schools. Recently, I lost a 22 year old who was in my first class of sixth graders. And he was a boy who just needed something else. We didn't have the resources to give him. He was so smart, so very smart, so very passionate about art, spatially intelligent. He could have been someone's engineer. He could have been someone's physicist. He could have solved world problems. But because the resources we were given at this predominantly black, very low income charter school were not enough to support and push him he never quite realized his potential. So if in the sixth grade, he didn't get what he needed, and then in the seventh, and the eighth, and ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grades, he didn't, I can only assume that in fifth, fourth, third, second, and first grade, he didn't either. Not only was all that potential lost for his benefit and for his life, but then how much better would our, our society, our neighborhoods, our communities have been because of him? And he's not the only one that I've lost. He was just the most recent one, and he was the sweetest baby, you know? And so I just, I, it's, it's both hard and easy to answer that question because equity, be, equity should be something that we all just nod and say yes to. That we all just, I mean, the, the research shows that when you do better by the least of these, when you do better by those who don't have much, you will inevitably do better by everyone. You know, I, I, my son is three years old, and I, you'll hear me, t hear me talk a lot about my son because he's taught me so much about education. He's taught me so much about how to view the landscape and understand how things are pitted both against him and then how my privilege now supports him, right? But the things that I try to teach him about humanity at three years old, in, in stark comparison to what I have to teach him about being a black boy and how I have to be ready to support him are would, would likely bring many to tears. And so that's what equity means to me. And that's why it's so important because it's everyone's child. You don't ever want to have to lose a baby. And, and I know at 36, I'm my mom's baby. Imagine if she lost me, you know, but imagine losing a child to something that resources could have prevented from happening. Well, thank you for that. I, I appreciate Christian. She reminds me so much of my mom, who, who was a kindergarten teacher for 35 years. And if you understand equity, you, you, you understand that if you teach kindergarten for 35 years and have 20 to 25 students every year, you know about equity, right? Mm -hmm. So um, let me move to one last question and, and then we'll open it up. And this is, uh, I want us to pivot to Pierre. And um, Pierre um, is, is, a, is a new initiative that, that was uh, recently formed between uh, Metro Public Schools and uh, Vanderbilt was engaged with that as well. And I know that um, Dr. Dr. Nation was very heavily involved in it. So was um, Mr. Reed. Uh, so, and of course, the, the, the chair, I was there when the chancellor and the provost um, and the dean, Camilla Bimbo, was there at the school board meeting a couple of weeks ago to announce it. So um, what led to the formation of PEER? Can someone provide a little more uh, background on it? And uh, how can others support the advocacy efforts? You want to start? I'll pick up. So, uh, PEER, I think, comes from a, a long engagement between uh, various faculty members uh, here at Peabody uh, with uh, the district. And, you know, I, I will take a, a little bit of a step back from, from focusing on PEER to say, you know, we can't talk about things like equity and and kind of the impact of community on, on uh, metro schools without talking about Vanderbilt. I mean, Vanderbilt has been a, a behemoth in this community and, uh, and has resources uh, that, that um, at various times have not been brought to bear on the very issues affecting a, a district that, is, that surrounds it. So I think part of the, the impetus for PEER has been to, to try to write, to start to write that wrong, is to recognize that we as an institution have some, some resources and some expertise uh, that can be valuable in, uh, in 
partnering with the district. And, and I, I say partnering intentionally because, you know, I, I, I think one of the, the tendencies um, uh, that has been true both here and with uh, higher ed institutions in general is to think that we know <laughs> and that if they would only listen, um, and I, I, you know, my work with the district and, and um, uh, you know, with, with Ashford and, and, and such, the complexities with which of the problems with which they are dealing is not something that we, that, that we know. I, I'll just put it that way. I mean, I think there's an opportunity for us to bring expertise but it's also an opportunity for us to learn uh, and, and to really think about kind of, um, I, I hate to use the term real world problems, but to think about how what we talk about here lives out in the world because it often lives very differently than the ways in which we talk about it. So I, I'm excited that there's, that things have come together in such a way as, as that we can, we can start community just between these institutions and beginning to, to be more intentional about this idea of making sure that, that young people have better and more opportunity uh, as a result of, of us coming together and working together. I mean, so I think about the first time I met Dr. Nation was probably at the onset of um, COVID and us working from home. and. I also serve as our uh, co-chair of our local Nashville My Brother's Keeper Network, uh, which focuses on how do we find supports and opportunities for young black and brown boys. Um, and we were talking about the data, right? We had a special session with several young men and uh, Dr. Nation talking about the data. What is the data showing us? Why I'm excited about peer and why I'm fortunate enough to actually be on the steering committee is because when we talk about equity, it has to be data driven. Right, and oftentimes people feel as though, oh, you're giving something away that somebody doesn't deserve, or all these different things, is just a bunch of fluff. You guys are gonna be in healing circles all day. But we talk about the need to get express data. And oftentimes the school district itself, you know, we have 80 some thousand kids, a lot going on. We don't have the infrastructure set up to have just only time to focus on specific research. We've identified, as Dr. Battle said, we want to make certain that every student is known, but one of our core tenets is to identify and eliminate inequities. With this program, with this partnership, because I believe in co-collaborating in partnership, not just this is what we want you to do, right? It has to be with us, and then we have to dig deeper in MMPS and even talking to parents and teachers and students, students, talking to students, like it's okay to talk to students, but that's another TED talk that we can go through and talk about as well. Um, but this is important that we can look at those equity indicators and we can actually understand what we're seeing to get to the root cause. I hate, I shouldn't say hate, I dislike doing performative work, mm -hmm. doing work that looks good, but are we actually addressing root cause to make change? We have set out that this is not performative, that we are going to look at root cause data issues, address them, get feedback from community, and then we set out to find expectations and we find solutions. Really important that we are data-driven to find those root causes. Now, as you all watch design, we understand one key root cause is racism, right? I think that's clear, but we also can identify other factors that are determinants in the inequities that we see beyond just race, whether it's gender, whether it's class, but what are those causes and how do we connect what the community is seeing to make sure that we're making positive change? And I think at the onset, important to what we're doing will be the narrative around what we're doing. Mm -hmm. People will say Vanderbilt is involved in everything. It's just Vanderbilt being Vanderbilt. MNPS just wasting time talking amongst each other, doing more coffees. But the narrative around how we scope what we're doing, the way that we keep community involved and updated along the way will be important to the community building trust in the process and us building a collaborative nature to show mm -hmm. we are really about the business of solving inequities and this is what it looks like. 
And hopefully people will understand, and I know we live in a microwave society, we can throw something in the oven and it's quick, and we can leave TV there and come right back to it. Equity is a process, inequities have taken place in 1619, mm -hmm. really before that, right? Mm -hmm. When the first Africans were here but fought for their freedoms, right? So inequities are not gonna switch over in a six month process, mm -hmm. in a year long process. But that is where the tension of outcomes versus process and procedure, we have to narrate what that actually looks like so we can achieve social educational change moving forward. So I think this is an opportunity for us to do more and to have the big behemoth that is Vanderbilt showcase their change model around inequities and how we face those together. And I would just say, you know, I am um, a product and a, a benefit of Vanderbilt because of, of, of a benefit of a Vanderbilt MNPS collaboration because in 2012, I came to Vanderbilt to get a second master's degree because Vanderbilt partnered with MNPS. They wanted to specifically look at uh, and target low income schools and build cohorts of teachers. So I got my master's in teaching and learning in urban schools. And we studied urban schools around the country. We were taught to think more critically. We were pushed and we were pushed to become uh, teacher leaders. And so I credit both Vanderbilt and a former, pr former principal of mine for actually making me you know, run for school board. I would have never considered that me as a teacher, I could lend my teacher voice and actually make sustainable change. And so I think about that and juxtapose that on peer and I'm, I'm looking forward to what will come in really decades from now, you know, because mm -hmm. like uh, Mr. Hughes said, Inequities won't be shifted overnight. They won't happen. You know, we won't see the benefit of them in a year or even two. It will take a generation of students. You know, I, <laughs> it'll be my Christopher who will benefit from it because he's in pre-K. You know, it'll be his children who years, years, years from now will benefit from that, you know. <laughs> and I, I, I think also about the idea that we have a billion dollar budget in MNPS. And for years, the community would push back and say, you're too top heavy. And then we would just keep cutting from central office, which meant we didn't have researchers. We didn't have a DEI department. We didn't have a choice, a school choice office. We didn't have people, we couldn't offer professional development. Like we didn't have thought partners in central office who were not classroom teachers because being a classroom teacher is enough in itself. I pinky swear. But we didn't have those who were outside of the classroom who could dedicate their time to reviewing data, to going in to support teachers and, and principals, to going into schools, or even to staying out of schools and thinking about how the community impacted them. Because like we've all alluded to, schools are where community issues bubble up. So if you don't have active thought partners thinking about and engaging with the community to solve problems that are, that are then found in schools, they will persist. And that's what's happened because for years we were too top heavy. So we had to cut everybody at the top which left no one to think big. Well, thank you all for, for that. I, I wanna just share with everyone, I'm still wearing my principal hat. I was principal for the day uh, for Metro <laughs> Schools. So, um, oh, thank you, I appreciate it. So I have all these ideas on how we can fix education uh, across the city, but enough of my questions. How about we open it up to the audience and uh, to, the, to our virtual audience? I think Dwayne has a, a microphone in his hand. If, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Don't feel um, obligated to ask a question, but this is the time to do it if you have one. And not all at once. I see one in the back, green shirt. This chat has been on fire, though. Oh, it has? Yeah. Oh, see, I can't really see. And thank you for your confidence to stand up and ask the first question. Well, thank you so much. Uh, watching the documentary was very eye-opening. I come from... Um, an African country, very diverse, but also um, the problem of race is everywhere, even in the countries where it's not supposed to be, because uh, in a country like uh, Morocco, where I come from, um, we don't have the, um, we choose where to go and where to go to school, so this system was very uh, different from where I come from. Uh, but was, we always watched uh, movies and documentaries about racial segregation from, I guess, around the world and from Morocco as well. But it's different to see it firsthand in the country where it's actually happening. We watched the famous movies like Selma and uh, Django Unchained and all the, it was shocking, but seeing it here, um, 
had a different effect on me and had me thinking about how about the people. It's not about the places or the events, but the people that these issues are affecting. Uh, when I came to Nashville, I thought it was a very diverse um, city, but then walking in my neighborhood, I live just across campus, and going and shop in uh, halal shops or in Knowlesville uh, Pike, I saw people who looked like me, but walking around uh, the area where I live, I rarely see those people. So then I realized that racial segregation that is still happening due to neighborhood segregation. And to go to my question, that's a long comment. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is uh, about what's happening in colleges. So access to colleges, um, we take into account diversity. There are quotas in uh, the prestigious universities. But I'm not sure if you've heard uh, recently of a controversial um, debate that happened between Princeton and MIT where they invited a professor. MIT invited a professor, but due to his controversial comments on diversity, his event was canceled. But Princeton brought him in. Uh, his comment was, colleges and universities should no longer take into account quotas and diversity, but they should focus on qualification. So it should be qualification only, uh, access to colleges and universities. So my question is, what is, first of all, what is your thought about his statement? And second, um, how, could, how can we not have quotas and um, rely only on qualifications when not everyone is given the same chances to access to those? colleges and universities. So if I'm uh, a kid who lives in a rich community and go to a good school, um, I have more chances to pass the, I took the GRE, so I'm not sure what you guys are taking, but there are a lot of standardized tests uh, that these kids need to take and they're uh, usually expensive, etc. So are we giving the same chances to everyone to be able to assess them the same way? And you also mentioned how um, you want everyone to go to their schools in their communities and public schools in their communities, but aren't we making those schools less diverse by doing that? Because everyone from the same community is going to the same school. So are we just recreating the community in the school? Don't we want the schools to be more diverse, to be from different backgrounds, different racial and ethnic and economic uh, backgrounds. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> Thank you. I can jump in. Um, so yes, I love the question about public schools or zone schools specifically. You know, why do I kind of encourage the community to consider their zone school first? I look at Nashville and I look at how gentrified it is. And true, I'm focusing more on my area, which is North Nashville, that downtown slash 37208 and 37203 zip code that was at one time very black, but is now very diverse, or at least very mixed. And I think about parent, I look at Buena Vista slash Jones, where my son goes to school. The schools across the, I mean, the, the houses across the street from that school, next door to that school, in front of that school, $600,000 homes. But my school is 98% free or reduced lunch, meaning that anyone with affluence or means has opted out. Then when I look at South Nashville, East Nashville, the rest of North Nashville. I mean, because West Nashville is our most is our most affluent area. That the Bell Mead, Green Hills, you know, Vanderbilt on out, those areas are predominantly affluent. But other parts of town are fairly gentrified, but e anyone with affluence opts out. So I'm more focused on areas where you can go to your zone school and you can offer your fundraising dollars there, but you choose not to. And even when I look at areas around Vanderbilt and Belmont, the Green Hills, Hillsboro areas, many of those parents are still, they're affluent, but they're still maybe opting out and sending their kids to private school. And so at the very least, the school could be a bit more diverse based on uh, racial, I mean, uh, economic background or economic sustainability, but it's not. And so 
so that would be my, my, my first comment, just for us to think about the areas of town where people are moving in, but then they're still not wanting to be part of the community. They like the area, they like the house, but they don't want to be part of the neighborhood because they don't want, to, they, they don't want their kids to play with the kids next door or go to the school with the kids that are in the, in the same school. Um, and I just think about the stark contrast in fundraising dollars. You know, I, I specifically look at East Nashville with Lachlan and Warner, and I use that example all the time, that Warner is the zone school and it's predominantly black. Lachlan is the magnet school that's lotteried in, and they're raising two and three hundred thousand dollars a year. They pay for a Spanish teacher. I mean, they pay for all kinds of things, but that school is predominantly white. If all of those parents just sent their kids to Warner, how different, how different the atmosphere would be and how much more mixed it would be. So I'm, it is very different depending on the school, the area of town, um, it, it, so many other factors. You're right in, in, in elevating that. But I think more often than not, across our 130 zone school or 130 schools that are operated by the district, how different it would look if people opted in to their, you know, their, zone, their school of zone. The other thing I want to say is that, you know, I went to MLK um, and I, I remember it being number one in the state when I graduated. But when I first came back to the school board, I remember hearing some parents say, you know, I really want my kid to go to Hume Fogg, but MLK, it's, it's just taking a turn for the worse. And I'm looking at the ACT scores, I'm looking at the GPAs, and I'm like, well, what's going on? But my little brother, my little brother is 15 years younger than me. I mean, I know I look young, but I'm not. So I go into that school, after, you know, I'm my first year on the board, and I'm looking for him just to say hi and introduce myself to the teachers. And the first thing I see at 7:45 in the morning is a group of black boys with football jerseys on, and they're sitting at a at a table before school starts. And I think this is why people are frowned upon. They frown upon him. Okay, it's a magnet school. It's still high performing. They still have Rhodes Scholars, but it's a lot more. No, better yet, it's a lot less anti-black than maybe some of the other area magnet schools. And, and that's not by design. I mean, it, it, it's just the way that parents have begun to list their rank when they apply for the lottery. But it's just interesting the kind of coded language parents were using to describe MLK, which is still a top performing school in the country versus Hume Fogg. So that was just, you know, just interesting to note that often, even if it's a school that's down the street that may not be a zone school, parents are still not even opting into that school because it's too something. It's unsafe. What does unsafe mean to elementary school students? What do you think that five-year-old is going to do to your child? And, and not to dismiss issues of violence or, you know, I mean, not to dismiss societal issues, but the coded language is interesting. And the last thing I'll say, because I know I could ramble forever, um, I, I am still learning to hone my frustration when I hear someone talk about um, not giving someone a handout. I remember my first week at NASA and looking around the room and seeing not, another, not a single other black woman not many other black people, not many people of color. And stereotype threat kept in, crept in very quickly. I felt like, oh, I don't, I don't deserve to be here. Someone is going to assume that I'm just a token Negro. And it's, it's a feeling that I don't wish on anyone. But I, I, also, I, I think about that in the same vein that I think about a former colleague of mine, Mr. Clay. And Mr. Clay one day told me, you know, Nashville, 440 owes my family a house. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, you know, uh, I'm uh, eminent domain. They took a home from my grandmother where we were all living. It was a three bedroom home. So you had three generations of a, a, a family living in that home that was going to be passed down to Mr. Clay's mom. And they were gonna then pass it down. You know, they were going to build generational wealth with this home that they had put so much investment in, so much time, energy and money into. And then eminent domain, not just sent them to another part of town. It sent them to a housing development, a housing project that was two bedrooms. So now this family went from owning something, owning land in 37208 that we now know is worth $1 million when I last checked on Zillow. That plot of land that Mr. Clay's home you know, was taken from him 60 years ago would have been worth a $1 million today. A million dollars. And so when I think about someone like this professor or this speaker who would dismiss how generations are now impacted by moves like that and how long it will take for that family to recover. What does that say about us as humans that we really can't think critically enough to think about how societal issues, how systemic issues, how generational issues will impact our children and their children and their grandchildren years from now? 
Well, gentlemen, I think she answered all I'm those sorry. questions. I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, that, I, I'm happy to pass question. it down to the other two, but I think you, you answered it. <laughs> First, yeah, let me say amen. <laughs> that's, 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 all right, do we but, have time for another question? Actually, I do, oh, want, I do sure. want to hit on, on, on two things real quickly, though. I mean, going back to the data, I mean, if, if we had um, the zone schools reflect the, pop, the communities for which they are zoned, I cannot think of a school, a metro school, that wouldn't be more diverse mm -hmm. as a result of that. And, and I think a second thing that you, you hit on is that I think is a huge issue for, for our district is that, that because people opt out, they have uninformed narratives about what is going on in the district. So you can hear all kinds of things about, you know, individual schools, what's happening at Bransford, all kinds of things that are not, that, that are not informed, and, but yet drive, often drive decision making and policy about how things should be invested. So, I, I would say that's another issue about that, that gets exacerbated when people opt out. Last thing I'd say is about higher education is that universities ideally should be about education. And, uh, and having been in many, many college classrooms, both as an instructor and as a, as a student, I have not found one that wasn't more enriched by diversity. So the idea that one could, could homogenize um, uh, based on a very constricted way of thinking about qualifications um, and, and think that there would be a grand benefit from that, again, is, is just very short-sighted. Thank you, thank you for that. I was uh, thinking um, that each one of the panelists have, have said some things tonight that they could just clearly take the microphone and just drop it. And I, on the count of three, I'm asking them to do it. But I'm gonna stop because I think Hasina is gonna make that come out of my budget if, I, if they break the microphones. So I don't, I don't think we're gonna do that. Uh, do we have time for one more question, maybe one from the virtual space or, or, or is this it? So we didn't have any questions from the virtual space and just a quick, like if you guys can hold your phone up and, and scan the QR code, we'd love to hear any thoughts you had about the panel or the film tonight. So we'd love to have that. I think NPEF also has a little survey. If you have their QR code, they'd love to hear from you too. We are happy to accept one more question if you guys are okay with it. If any, someone else had a question. Okay, thank you. I guess they're gonna take it to the back. Uh, hi, my name is Welton Pride. I'm a first year CDA student here in Peabody, a uh, national native and MNPS graduate. Went to Meigs and Hume Fogg, so have a little beef with them, okay. <laughs> uh, we were also number one in the state when I graduated, but I digress. Uh, as in the video, we saw that urban planners and urban planning had a, a huge impact on the design of segregated communities and constituted uh, the growth and impacts within MNPS schools. So with Nashville growing so rapidly and uh, with the gentrification and urbanization that we see today uh, and the urban planning going through the redistricting that is currently going through, what collaborations does MNPS and the board have with urban planning and the current efforts right now? Uh, so it's interesting, you know, so to kind of recap for him, the census just came out, which means that redistricting happens both at the, the local, the city and the state level. So that means that school boards, although we're re not rezoning schools, we are rezoning what elected officials serves you. So um, because the census is not equitably distributed often, you know, there were definitely more efforts this year, this go round than in 2010, but because of that, everybody, mm, I'm sorry, I have so many thoughts. I would just say we are working with the Planning Commission. We, we spoke with them regularly while they were kind of reviewing census data to help us redistrict, and we were offering our thoughts around what advocacy might look like, making sure that you don't leave diverse groups or, or break up diverse groups. So let's say that there is a large Curtis population. You don't want them split up amongst three different school board districts. You want them to be able to um, rally around, around candidates of their choice, you, but you also want to be, in, be mindful that you don't want them excluded, that you don't want them to have one representative and then have everyone else that doesn't share a lived experience uh, with them that you know that might outvote them 
So we, we did a lot of, we had a lot of conversation with them as individual board members, but now, right now as we speak, it is, they are open to feedback from Nashvilleians. Mm -hmm. So that means reach out to the city council, uh, go to Nashville.gov, reach out to the planning commission, review the district maps, both for uh, the school board and for the city council, mm -hmm. and, and offer your thoughts. Um, I went from having, I think, 35 schools in my district. I think I, I have about, what, a, a quarter of our schools, but there are nine school board members. I've gone down to 30, yay, but one of my colleagues has nine. Another of my colleagues has 11. That means that my advocacy is split up a lot differently than their advocacy is. And so we've got to be mindful of that you know, every year, but certainly during census years, about how we offer feedback, how we fill out the census, and what that means long term for elected officials. And that's not equity, right? It's not equity at all. <laughs> got it. Uh, any other thoughts? I, I would just add one thing, Welton, that um, you, they do have in-person meetings that they're doing, so if, if you're interested in it, you can attend some of them. So just go to the website, and you can go and offer your perspective on that as well. Any final thoughts from you, Ashford, or Dr. Nation? Man, it's a, a couple of things. One, I believe when we talk about what is needed in schools to, to move the needle, I think we need a city that champions public education and believes that public education has to continuously be funded adequately and that every child needs a champion and then we owe it to each other to champion success for our children. I also for this group here would, would ask that you read, I'm a advocate for four things to read, um, to, to just think and reflect in context. One is a, uh, written by James Ball when it was a message to teachers and he actually had a speech with teachers I think everybody in this room and mm -hmm. college students should read a message to teachers by James Baldwin I think there's another recent article that came out I can't remember the author mm -hmm. but the title of this article is that America loves black culture but doesn't love black people and I want that to sit with everybody as you read that and understand what that context mean America loves black culture but doesn't love black people. When you think of the context of public education, the fight that families had to go through just to achieve uh, access to quality education. There's a book by Bettina Love, Dr. Bettina Love called, uh, We Want to Do More Than Survive. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to her experience as a, a professor uh, growing up in education and that black, brown, low income students want to do more than just survive. We don't want to go through life just surviving, right? It has to be more to that, right? And then there's another book. I can't remember the author, but the book uh, is called No More Bad Stats. Black people need enough people to believe in black people, not to believe all the bad stats about black people. Uh, uh, there you go, right? Another good book that speaks to Okay, this is what some data is showing, but let's get to the root cause and knee deep analysis of what we're seeing when we talk about expectations and things of that nature. I think where we are right now is a time of reflection, but I don't want us just to live in reflection. We have to move towards action. And action is gonna look different for everybody. Some people are gonna protest. Some people are gonna go to the planning meeting. Some people are gonna be in these rooms and strategize. Some people are going to go to their brothers and sisters who are going to elementary schools and say, you need to get and learn more about the culture of those around you. And not just we're going to do this one month off potluck, but we really are going to learn about cultural wealth of communities. Right now, we all talk about, oftentimes talk about our faith. The most segregated place in this country every Sunday is church, church. is a place of faith. Right. That's by, I dare say, by design. But that is our comfort. Mm -hmm. Right. How do we then in turn talk about we need to be this diverse community when we can't break bread or come together in faith and spirit amongst each other in certain uh, entities in certain spaces? I think right now is a time that we have to move the needle forward. And right now is a time that, my God, we just want to be sometimes. Right. We're in the midst of we're still in the midst of COVID. You all are wearing masks. Right. Think about if you had a son like myself, that's three and for a year and a half, you know, he had not seen anybody's face except his mom and dad and his brother because everybody has on a mask and the trauma, the things that he's going to have to break out of because of that. I think we all need grace amongst each other, but we can't sugarcoat the facts. Right. 
history is empirical. We can go and research it, right? I know that folks want to say we don't want to teach that because my fourth grader may feel a certain way, but history, especially lived experience by certain people, makes me feel a certain way. Why do my feelings not matter as much? And I think we need to function as if we all are in this together. You know, it's cliche to talk about Dr. King and brotherhood, and oftentimes we water down his message, but we actually are all in this together, right? We're going to either live together or die together. Point emphasis, the environment. If we don't work on that together, we're really going to be up a creek, and you know what I mean? Uh, so now is a time that we really have to understand that every child needs a champion, and as a city, we must champion public education together, and it can't be only on schools to do that. It can't only be on the teacher that is working 60 hours a week, plus dealing with her kids to do that. It has to be all of us combined, and Vanderbilt and other entities have to partner with us to step up to make that come to fruition. All right, well, I, I, Dr. Nation. And, and uh, I'll just say real quickly, um, I think one of the, the take homes that, that I would remind you of is that this is real. Um, as Chairman Bugs uh, talked about the young person that, that, that she had lost, I, I, I was thinking about those that I've lost and I, I'm, I'm sure uh, Mr. Hughes has folks that, that, that he's lost and um, and schools play such a central role in that. <clears throat> it's, it's where, um, uh, because all kids, or most all kids go there, is one of those touch points that, that we have to make a difference. And I would say for all of you, um, this is our watch for for making a difference in this. So whether it means, as they said, going to, to council meetings, uh, if it means um, going and working directly with a school, uh, becoming a teacher, working with a child, tutoring, uh, we all have a role in this. And I hope that this at least spurs you to think about what yours is, because uh, uh, this, this is real. And you, your thing could be running for office. Baby, I am looking for someone to take over my seat because I am done <laughs> after this. So please consider running for office or at least supporting a candidate that you really believe in. But really, if you, if you live in the North Nashville area, come find me. I will help train you. Well, I want to thank each of you for coming out tonight. I want to thank the people in the virtual world for joining us. Uh, I hope that you all enjoyed this presentation, this panel discussion, as much as I did. Uh, I want to thank Peabody EDI uh, for hosting this event, along with uh, others, um, Vanderbilt Teaching and Learning, the Division of Government and Community Relations, and maybe one more. Who did I leave off, Dwayne? Well, just no charges to my head and not my heart. So thank you all for being here and join me in thanking our panelists. And please enjoy the cookies outside. We have sugar cookies. Please save me one. <laughs> you know they're going to be gone. The college students I had one from Walk Walk I had to. 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 I